Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're encouraged and challenged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. been in a series at the movies, and I hope you've uh, benefited and grown through this series. Uh, we've been looking at four different popular movies that we have uh, over these last few weeks. I want to tell you that we are not endorsing these movies in any way, uh, so don't, don't take this endorsement. We're looking at principles and application, and then we're going to the Word of God and seeing what the greatest story ever has to say about how we live our life. And so today we're looking at the movie Creed. And you saw the trailer, and you know what's coming up, and it's in, it's in that whole lo long line of Rocky movies. Uh, so it started a long time ago. Now we're in about seven. I think Creed's number seven, if you count it as one of the Rocky movies. They don't make movies like Rocky anymore, right? That was a great one. Everybody say it with me. Yo, Adrian! Yeah, you got to do it with more angst, more uh, feeling. Yo, Adrian! Uh, there you go. Not too bad. Okay, so anyway... Uh, remember, his, remember in Rocky one, his very first opponent was a guy by the name of Apollo Creed. And that was the first guy he fought. And Creed is a movie about his son. And so now Rocky's that old and Creed's already gone. And so now his son is coming up and he's the title character in the movie. And in the movie, Creed's son Adonis didn't really know who his father was as a kid. He didn't know who he was at all, but he knew he was born to fight. He said, it's in my blood. I've got to fight. I was born to fight. I was born for this. I was born to be a fighter, and it kind of comes out. I want to tell you something. When we surrender our hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says we are adopted into his family. And because I am in his family, I too am born to fight. I have warrior's blood inside of me. I have the Lord's blood inside of me. And so it's in our blood Fighting is our blood, spiritual warfare is in our blood. We, by very virtue of the fact of who our father is, who's a good, good father, we know that we also were born to fight. Christ came into the world and he fought with principalities and powers and dominions and the rulers of darkness. Uh, he came and he came for our salvation and he shed his blood on the cross. And when he shed his blood on the cross, the Bible said, It is finished. He was announcing the defeat of the enemy. It is in that moment, according to Scripture, the prophetic word in Genesis chapter 3, he was crushing the serpent's head. He gave his life on Calvary. Now, every single one of us who are followers of our Heavenly Father are fighters. We're fighters. We were born for this time and for this moment. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you were made good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. How does a fighter win the battle? How does it happen? I want to give you three things this morning. If you have your outlines, you can follow along with me today. They should be on the back if your bulletin's there. First of all, number one, if we're going to win in this fight that we are called into by virtue of the fact that I'm a child of God, is we got to know who our enemy is. we got to recognize our enemy because the enemy wants to take you out. He wants to destroy you. And if we fail to recognize him, then your guard will be down. And when you least expect it, first of all, he'll hit you with a body blow right here. It will buckle you down, and then he will come up with a haymaker underneath the chin, and you will be flat on your back, and he will take you out. And so you better know that the enemy's out to take you out. He doesn't like you. He hates you. He wants to destroy you in any way he can. The devil is a powerful adversary. John 10 and 10 describes a little bit of his tactics. The thief 
comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 describes him this way. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So he is a lion. He is out to destroy you and take you out. His influence in this world is very, very real. Now let me tell you the most deceptive lie that Satan uses, that he plants into our brain. He's an accuser of the brethren, by the way. One of his definitions or title is the accuser of the brethren. Let me tell you a little bit what seed or what thought he tries to plant into your mind, into your brain, and it's simply like this. The Father is really holding out on us. He doesn't really love us or care for us. I want to tell you that is simply a lie from the devil himself. It's the same thing that, that, that Satan suggested to Eve. And so you go all the way back to the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden, and Satan is there, and Eve is in the garden, and he basically says, you know what, if God really loves you, why won't he let you eat from all the trees? Why keep a tree back? Why withhold anything from you if, if he really, really cared about you, if he really, really loved you, then you should be able to eat of every single tree in the garden. Why does he keep you in the dark? Because he says, in the day you eat of that tree, you will be like God. And so the temptation is to question the love of God, ultimately. Satan tempted Jesus in the same way. Remember when, and, and when he was on that mount of temptation and the enemy comes and he attacks them with three very specific temptations that deal with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Remember, remember the, the subtle temptation that is there when he's hungry, he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and, and so he basically says, why are you so hungry, Jesus? If God really loved you, he wouldn't put you through all this. In fact, you could just speak the word and turn this rock into a loaf of bread. If God really loved you, he wouldn't keep you hungry like you are now. And Jesus responds by this statement, and I want you to get this. He says, man does not live by bread alone. In other words, since God is good, we don't need anything else but God. And if we'll get that through our minds and through our understanding that God is a good, good father, he's a good, good God. We sang about it in a couple of different songs. He's our father, and he is good, and he is always good. And if he's always good, he is really all I ever need. God's good. He completely satisfies with God. I don't need anything else. But here's the lie. Once I start to believe or doubt the goodness of God, I become attracted by Satan's offers. I become attracted to what he has to give me or the, or the temptation that is out there. And that desire within will reach for his bait and then he has me hooked. It all stems from doubting the goodness of God. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. And when I doubt his goodness, when I don't believe his goodness, when I don't fully grasp it, when I feel like he's holding back on me in some way, then pretty soon the bait of Satan looks all that much more appealing and alluring, and I reach for that. There's something better, I think, that's out there, and so I follow his bait. It's the goodness of God that keeps us from sin. David forgot the goodness of the Lord, took Satan's bait, listen to me, and committed adultery and later murder. Now, now he sinned initially because somehow he bought into the lie that God was not good, that he's withholding something better from him. And so he buys into that lie. You say, how do you get that? Well, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and look at verse number 7. After he commits adultery, after he commits murder, the prophet Nathan comes to him and nails him for the sins he'd committed. Now he's already, this has been several months now after those acts have been committed. Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. 
Why do you despise the word of the Lord by doing the evil, by doing the evil in, these, in your eyes? In other words, he says, I gave you, I gave you, I would have even given you more. I am a good God, I'm a good father, I will give you every single thing you need in this life. You did not have to go after Bathsheba. You did not have to kill Uriah. I gave you everything. And once in our minds we begin to doubt the goodness of God, that God is a good, good father, we go through a trial, we go through a test, we face adversity, we have a setback, and we begin to say, why me, Lord? Then we justify our reaching out and trying to satisfy our own desires by turning that rock into a loaf of bread. Are you getting this? It all stems from doubting the goodness of God. If you will understand how good our Heavenly Father is, you never need to wander off into sin anywhere, at any time, in any place, because God is good. He's got everything we need. Jesus Christ totally satisfies everything in our life. Wow. Now here's the, the, the that's the enemy, that's the lie of Satan. The fear of the Lord must always be balanced by the love of God. The Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, but it also talks about the love of the Father. If you have only the fear of the Lord, you resort to legalism and condemnation and judgment. But if you balance that with the love of God and the fact that we have a good, good Father, it will keep us from sin. Those two things, working together, works inside of us to change us from the inside out. So don't buy the lie of the devil that God's not good. I don't care what's going on in your life, God is always good. But really, when it all boils down, our own worst enemy is me. As bad and nasty and mean as Satan is, he's really not my worst enemy, it's right here. It's me. I am my very own worst enemy. Take a look. All right, Donnie, get into your stance. Make a small target, turn sideways. Okay. You see this guy here staring back at you? Yeah. That's your toughest opponent. Every time you get into the ring, that's who you're going against. I believe that in boxing, and I do believe that in life. Okay? Let's throw a jab in the jaw. All right, one to the gut. Now, every time he punches this guy, what's he doing? Start one back at That's me. right. So either you block it, slip it, or get out of the way. So. I'll leave you two alone for a while. Good luck. All right. Turn to James chapter 4. It says it very, very clearly in the Word of God. James 4. We really are our own worst enemies. And if you understand that, that is the first step in overcoming this battle and winning in the spiritual battle we're in. Look at, look at chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something and you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend it, spend what you get on your pleasures. How many times have we said, oh, I've blown it. I've blown it again. And every time I determine I'm going to resist temptation, sin pokes up its ugly head, and I fall, and I stumble, and I fail, all over again, and we begin to cry out, what's wrong with me? I, I can't be victorious. I seem to be doing the same things over and over and over again, and why do I keep stumbling and falling along the way? Will I ever break out of this kiss and make up syndrome with God? It's like I, I blow it again, and God help me, and, and we kiss and make up, and we go on, but that happens over and over and over again. The Bible tells us in verse number one that I just read to you, it says the source is the desires that battle within you. 
It's from the inside. It battles from within us. In fact, we looked at the first movie, The Inside Out. It all starts on what's going on the inside. We looked at Star Wars, and kind of the theme was Romans chapter 7. The good things I want to do, I don't find myself doing. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing over and over again. And we talked about this battle with self and the law and all that surrounds that. So we've kind of been looking at this a little bit over this theme of this four series. And, 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 and the Bible says it's the desire, some translations say the lust within you. Lust or desire. That word in the Greek language is the word hedone. H-E-D-O-N-E. Slash over the E. It, it's where we get our word hedonism from. Lust. Desire. Hedonism. It's, the, it's your desires are carrying on, the Bible says, this internal war that is going inside of you. In other words, the battle is within you. It's an internal war that you are dealing with, and it's fighting for gratification. Your lust, your flesh wants to be gratified. It wants to be fed. It wants to be coddled. It wants to be uh, fulfilled at any expense, any desire. And so there's always this internal war going on, whether I'm going to satisfy my lust of my flesh or I'm going to walk in the Spirit of God. This wars with my flesh. The verse 2, you see the paradox of sin. He says you want or you lust and you do not have. That's the paradox of sin in and of itself because we are always seeking for gratification in our lust, in our flesh, but we never ever find it. It never really satisfies us. The world can never satisfy. The world will never give you peace. The world will never give you joy because inside of every one of us there is a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. So it says, you lust, but you do not have. You want satisfaction, you reach for satisfaction, you try to fulfill it in your own lust, in your own desires, and you go whatever you want, it still leaves you empty. You lust, but you still do not have. In other words, a new car won't do it for you. A new home won't do it for you. A new job won't do it for you. A new wife won't do it for you. None of those things can bring you happiness. An old rocker once said, and he's very old now, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> and I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. I just can't get no satisfaction. We are our own worst enemy. It's a battle, it's a war that takes place inside of us, inside of me. Turn to James chapter 1, and he really nails it here. James chapter 1, and we'll start with verse number 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now, now James is going to say, God's a good father. God's a good God. Don't blame God when things go wrong. Most of the time, things go wrong in my life, I brought on myself. But each one is tempted when he is drawn by his own evil desire. It's our lust. It's our desire. He is dragged away and enticed. Then after, sin, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good, here's the, here's the lie of the enemy, God's not good. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. In other words, God's not in the tempting business. God our Father's a good God. God wants you to succeed. He's not against you. So don't blame God for your problems. Amen. Or don't ever doubt his goodness. Amen. He says when you're tempted, you're led away by your own desires, your own flesh, your own evil inside of you. The war is going on inside of me. It's not even totally correct to blame the devil if you're a child of God. 
Let me say that again. The devil's alive. He is well. He is on the face of the planet Earth. But if you are a child of the Most High God and covered in his blood, it is not even totally theologically correct to blame the devil. Yes, we know he's the source of all sin, but James 1 tells us when a man sins, he is led away by his own flesh. His own flesh. You can't say, the devil made me do it. Verse 14, we are drawn away by our own lust. Now here's the rub here, listen to me. Until we are willing to accept personal responsibility, we will never deal with the true source of our problems and gain victory. If we are always blame shifting, these problems keep on resurfacing over and over again. Now here's the the truth, and listen to me. If you are a child of God, with every temptation sent by the enemy comes two doors. Behind door number one is God's way of escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, God will with that temptation make a way of escape. Excuse me, chapter 10. God will with that temptation make a way of escape. It is God's way of escape, door number one. Or you can choose door number two, Satan's way of defeat. He says you're led away by your own flesh. He says ultimately that will lead to your death. The fact that we so often choose door number two is not God's fault. The fact that I choose door number two, I choose the lust, I choose that woman, I choose the lie, I choose to respond in anger, I choose to do those things, uh, simply means I have followed door number one, I have, or door number two, I've given into my own lust. Shifting blame. We, we love to shift blame, don't we? It's everybody else's fault. It's never my fault. It's everybody else's fault around me. I don't know about you. I get a little annoyed when I see those uh, attorney commercials coming on the air. Dial one nine 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 nine, or dial one eight million, or dial, you know, you've been hurt in an accident, please get your attorney on the phone right away. No matter how minor that neck injury might be, we can get you millions of dollars. As a result, my insurance rates are going through the roof every year because of frivolous lawsuits. There have been lawsuits that have been made throughout history that are really ridiculous. There was a time, and this was years ago, but I remember it very well. Someone sued McDonald's because their hamburgers made them fat. (laughs) Yeah, I probably did, but you didn't have to eat there. Don't sue the hamburger manufacturer. There there was a time when tobacco industry came under many lawsuits because it was discovered that caused cancer, and they died. Now, we've been told that tobacco will cause cancer, and it will kill you. We've been told that for years, and yet we keep on smoking, and, and then we want to come back and blame the cigarettes. Drunk driver kills somebody on the road. So they sue Jim Beam or Budweiser or somebody else because that made me drunk and that's why I killed somebody and so let's go after the big company with the big pockets. Now I'm not, I I wouldn't mind seeing those companies close down but but I'm telling you, it's not right. We're led away by our own lust. You chose that door, door number two. Instead of God's way of escape. A lot of blaming going on. We blame mom and dad for every negative action I do today. It's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault. My dad wasn't really nice, and I'm mad. I'm angry today. Well, you have a new father. Got a new daddy. You got a new papa who's a good, good God. We blame our children for our impatience. You're getting on my nerves. Now, I got to tell you, I got to be honest here. When I was a kid, it really was my fault because I really could get on somebody's nerves. We blame our husband or wife for my anger. Their fault, they're pushing all my buttons. We blame our, our wife for my adultery because she wasn't meeting my needs or my desire for pornography or whatever else because there's no intimacy in my marriage, so it's all my wife's fault that I'm looking at these girly pictures. We blame the church because nobody shook my hand. It's all the church's fault I'm not there today. 
Somebody hurt my little feelings. <laughs> you see, it's easier to blame than accept responsibility for our actions. Jane tells us, don't deceive yourself. God's not tempting you, number one, because God's a good God. He says, when you're led away, you're led away by your own lust, your own flesh, your own desires, and you still don't have. Blame shifting is as old as mankind. It goes back to Adam. What's Adam say? The wife you gave me. She made me do it. She made me eat that apple. Whatever fruit it was, I said apple, I don't know. Uh, and, and blames Eve directly, but you know what? He's indirectly blaming God. Now listen to me, the wife you gave me, it's, it's your mate selection that went awry here. It's not really the woman I wanted, but I stuck with Eve, and so we're here. There's no other woman to choose from. She's the only one. Lord, you could have done better. The wife you gave me. So there's a, there's a secondary blame right there on God. And then the woman blames the serpent. The devil made me do it, Right? And ever since, we've been blaming somebody else for our own lust. If we are going to be victorious and move into a realm of spiritual victory in our life, we've got to quit blaming everybody else and understand, I need help from God, and it's me, O oh Lord, in need of repentance, in need of change, in need of transformation, in need of help. And then we put ourselves in a position where God can start working on us from the inside out. Now, in order to overcome these enemies, both the devil and our own flesh, the second thing is a fighter must be disciplined. A fighter must be disciplined. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and look at verse number 9. And I'll read through 27. You may only have 26 on the screen, but uh, the whole thing is a, is a boxing analogy. Paul loves sports. And so that's why Creed just kind of fell right into this series because he was a boxer. He loved boxing or loved to go to the matches and that's kind of who he was. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. In other words, we're fighting an eternal battle. This is more than just a temporary wreath that's gonna wither on your head. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly, I do not fight like a man beating the air. In other words, I don't just engage in shadow boxing. Listen, we're all great shadow boxers. We can swing our hands and we can look really good. I, you saw how good I looked coming on the stage. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. There is a need of spiritual discipline in our life if we're going to learn to be victorious over the devil and over the flesh. Take a look at this clip. I'm going to take you to this place called the Front Street Gym up in North Philly. It's pretty good. Okay. You got to train there because I don't want you to train in the same place as the guy is. You're going to be fighting, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. No, don't get in. Well, I want you to run alongside. I'm kind of antique, right? Yeah. So I'll drive. And you try to keep up. Well, how close is it? It's close enough. All right. Hey, hey, let me warm up real quick. Wake up! He said it was close. Yeah, not that close. This is Frankfurt. Tough place. You want to be a Philly fighter? This is the place to go. Philly fighters, you know, I think they're the toughest guys in the world. In a lot of ways. Maybe it's in the water. I don't know, but great place, though. So with all these bikes? It's a Philly thing. These guys are popping wheelies and making noise, going up and down the street. You right? No, I had a Harley once, but I fell off, so I decided to use my feet. Now, this kid, Sperino, he's got something special. He's no pushover, so you're going to have to work. You know what I mean? What do you think? Not bad, huh? Not bad at all. Yeah, this will get the job done. Really will. Oh, look at this, guys. Hey, the gang's all here. Good, Donnie. Look at this. 
This is the crew if I ever saw one. Hey, Batman, good hey, to see you. Come on, Jack. Long. This guy's so good with the mitts, he's gonna teach a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of knowledge and stitch. Best cut man in Philadelphia. But we don't need him. And over here is Elvis Grant. He makes the best glove in the world. Uh-huh. And as my present to you, starting out on the right foot, thank you, man. he's gonna make you a pair of gloves so Ooh. your hands don't get so bad as me. What? Is that coffee I smell in there? Yeah, that's coffee. All right, you guys get to know each other. Come here. All right. All right. How do we train? Our new nature needs to be fed. You need to feed that new nature. It needs to be nourished. How do you feed it? Daily in the Word of God. The Word of God will keep you from sin. The Word of God is a light into my path. It's a lamp into my feet. It will keep me from sin. It will keep me from stumbling and falling. If I know this Word of God, I will be strong in battle. I read Matthew 4, 4 earlier. Let me say it again. Man does not live on bread alone. But every word that comes from the mouth of God, we are getting God's word into our spirit. That is our source of life. That is our sustenance. That is our key to spiritual victory. So I want to challenge you, church, listen to me. Study the word. Know the word. Quote the word. Pray the word. Get into the word. Now, there are other disciplines that are also very, very important. Prayer is an incredible discipline. Talking to God, building that relationship with him. Meditation, meditating on the word, meditating on the Father, meditating on the Lord. Fasting, it disciplines this flesh, this body, so I can focus on God for an extended period of time. By the way, January the 1st, we will fast as a church, as a body, from the 1st through the 8th, Because we're believing God's going to bring an incredible harvest. And we're going to fast for souls and fast for the lost. And we're going to prepare our hearts for what God wants to do in us in the coming year in 2017. Giving. Giving is a great discipline. Giving breaks that that, uh, greed in your heart and in your life. And so it's an incredible discipline when you give on Sunday morning. Our worship. Praising the Lord, worshiping God can be a strong part of our spiritual armor and warfare. Ministry, getting involved in ministry is a very important spiritual discipline. I believe every child of God ought to have some kind of identifiable ministry. Something that we are doing beyond ourselves. okay? Ministry, uh, church attendance and being in church every single week and being involved in your small group somewhere are incredible disciplines that will help you grow spiritually strong. All these disciplines strengthen you, and through that you can become a mighty warrior. Now listen to me. I know it was a little hard to understand. First of all, Sylvester Stallone can't speak right. He mumbles anyway. And so even when you have a great TV set and the sound's perfect, you still can't understand a word he's saying because it's not a lot of... So you didn't get a lot what he was saying, but when he got done running and they went up into the gym, uh, he was introducing him to the team that would be working with Creed. There was a man there that was his cut man. He says he's the best cut man in the business. He can cut the, the bleeding and stop the bleeding and do all that. Of course, Rocky would be his coach. Someone else was going to be his trainer and, and taking the punches. And he had three guys that were gathered around. Let me tell you something. Everybody needs someone in their corner. You're going to win and fight in the fight and win the spiritual battle. You can't do it on your own by yourself. You need your cut man because we're going to get cut out there in the world and we need someone to come along and fix us and help us and work through that with us. We need someone to train us spiritually and get our punches right and take the punches for us. We need someone to to box against and spar with. We need someone that will be in our corner encouraging us. And you'll see in the fight scene coming up, you'll see Rocky's right there encouraging them and helping them through because he's got to win that fight and win that battle. I want to tell you, our life groups are so, so important. I cannot overemphasize that. The tragedy is probably 30 to 40 percent of our church are involved in groups, maybe maybe 45 percent. So that means 55 percent of you aren't going to any group, anywhere, anytime, any place. And we got them here at the church on Wednesday night. We got men's groups and ladies group and young adults groups. And we have uh, 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 senior groups, and we have every kind of group imaginable, young marriage groups and singles groups and and all kinds of groups, and they meet together and they pray and they study the Word of God together and they hold each other accountable, and we're growing in Christ Jesus and we're sharing and doing life together. The few amens come from those who are involved in groups. (laughs) 
I'm passionate about this because it is a key to our spiritual victory. Who's in your corner? And number three, the fighter knows his identity. He knows his identity. Now, obviously we can only show a few clips from the movie, but uh, for time's sake, but Adonis growing up didn't know who his daddy was. Didn't know who his father was because he's bounced around from foster home to foster home, and uh, he was actually born out of an illegitimate affair that his, uh, uh, his daddy had had, Apollo Creed, with somebody else, and he got back with his wife, and the, they were all out of the picture, and Apollo Creed dies early in the movie, and so it's all done. And in the same way, and, and, and when he finds out, and he finds out who he is, that he is the son of Apollo Creed, they want him to change his name because it's going to build up the boxing gate and all that if they know he's from Apollo Creed and they call him Creed. And he didn't want to take that name because he felt he could never live up to the legacy of his father. And so that's kind of the underlying plot of the movie. And in the same way, I think sometimes we feel condemned by our past. And we can't live up to the name of Christ or Christian. And we have struggle with that because we sin. I've failed so much. I'm not worthy. God can't use me. I've really messed up again and again and again. And I can't live up to that name. But our identity is not found in our failures. It is found in Jesus Christ. It is found in what Christ Jesus did for us on Calvary and nothing else. We cannot save ourselves. We are only saved through the precious blood of Jesus and the fact that he took my place. So our identity as people is all tied up in who he is. So I have a good, good father, and I know who he is. And because I know who he is, then I know who I am in Christ Jesus. If we understand our victories in Christ, he's already won. He's already won. So I don't allow my failures to define who I am. And we won't be ashamed of our identity as a child of God. Take a look at this last clip. To the body, trading shots. Pawing with his jab. Creed looks to land one big shot. Oh, my. Get up, D! Come on, baby. Stitch! <laughs> Creed just got up like a man possessed. He was down, but not out. Thinks he's celebrating a knockout. Hey, but the referee is dusting hey, Creed's gloves. Hey, Creed beats the count, and the action begins again. That's the heart of the champion. He has his daddy's heart, I'll tell you that much. Daddy, be ready. Hey, more work to do for Conlon. Body shot. Body shot. Trying to set Creed up one more time. Stitch has done a great job over that right eye, but now the left eye is looks like it's almost shut. That was enough. I should have stopped this one, your father. I'm stopping this one now. Don't, okay? Let me finish. I gotta prove it. Prove what? I'm not a mistake. Whoa! I won't tell you how it ends. You'll have to watch it yourself later. You're not a mistake. You're loved by your father. You're your father's son. You're your father's daughter. You are loved by him. And it's when he had that vision, that last, I don't know if you saw those clips as he's on the ground. It, it, it was only supposed to be like eight seconds. But whatever, he has all these flashes going through his brain. And the last flash he had of his daddy, Apollo Creed, fighting in that earlier match in Rocky number one, and then he jumps up and he's going to continue the fight. Listen, if we're going to be victorious, we've got to understand who our daddy is and who we are in Christ Jesus. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to close with this thought. Romans 8.1 says, There's therefore now 
no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You are not a mistake. You are not condemned because you are in Christ. But I want to read this to you, 2 Timothy 4, another great fight scripture. It says in verse number 7, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul's writing Timothy in this passage. He's writing from a Roman prison. His body's weak. He's been beaten many times. He's been shipwrecked. He he talks about all that he went through in his lifetime. And death is going to come very shortly. And so this is the last letter the Apostle Paul will ever write is 2 Timothy. And he's writing to his son in the faith. And when the Romans are going to come in, his death is going to be brutal. It's going to be fast. They're going to take off his head with one blow of the sword. But in the face of imminent death, he leaves this incredible testimony. I fought the good fight of faith. I've been in the ring. I've fought principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. I've been fighting for the souls of men. I've been fighting for every new church that's been planted. I've been fighting for the churches. I've been fighting for souls. And I've done the very best I can. I fought the good fight of faith. Now I want to ask you a question. What is your legacy going to be? When you come to the end of your journey on the earth, what are you going to be able to say? What is your, this is his epitaph. This is, is what's going to go on his tombstone. I fought the good fight of faith. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. I've finished strong. What's going to be said about us? How are you finishing? When we know our identity in Christ Jesus, we got fight in our blood. It's in our blood. We're fighters. It's in our blood because I am a child of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, you will get knocked down. Rocky got knocked down. Creed got knocked down. We all get knocked down. Everybody does. But we will get back up because I have the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. Because he says there's a championship prize, a crown of everlasting life that is waiting for me. What's your legacy going to be?